My name's Adele Onyango and welcome to another episode of Legally Clueless. No, seriously, I have no clue what I'm doing, but I'm pretty sure I'm not the only one. Hey you, welcome to episode 102 of Legally Clueless. Thank you so much for listening to this podcast, for being part of the tribe. I really do appreciate you. And a special shout out to everybody who has just discovered this podcast. Welcome to the family, better late than never. Be sure to join our online spaces on Instagram. You can find us at Legally Clueless Podcast. There's a direct link to that in the description of this episode. And on Twitter, if you're chit-chatting about the podcast, please just use the hashtag Legally Clueless. I genuinely try to respond to each and every tweet with that hashtag. <laughs> like, that sounds a bit stalkery, but <laughs> just ignore that. It's not creepy at all. Just use the hashtag. However, I am super excited for this episode because the story featured are by a family, well, a member of a family who are doing something that I really envy. Like, they sold some of their stuff, packed up the remainder, and became a full-time traveling family. Listen to this. Praying that I'd be able to get out of this village life and have experience of Nairobi. Early years of marriage are crazy sometimes, especially if you get married young, the finances. I got married at 24. When Kevin and I met, we both had a desire to travel. We've always had this fear for, no, we can't travel because we don't have the money. And then if we start traveling, how will our family look at us? Let's sell everything. And then we just go. So we drove down from Nairobi and our first stop was at Kilifi. Hiking with a 17 month old that is still breastfeeding and she just wanted to breastfeed every single minute. So at this point, actually, each of us has a backpack of clothes one of the questions we get a lot is then how do the kids get education we were not coming for a vacation this is now our life i don't think i am capable of going back renting a house and staying in one place that is faith and she's going to be sharing hers and her family's story a little later in this episode trust me you're just going to be so inspired to want to just get up and travel but first i really wanted to share two things that i either stumbled on was thinking about and one of them i had a conversation with a very good friend of mine about this week number one is showing up for yourself so i have a friend who made a decision that comes completely freaks them out and has been freaking them out for a while but they finally bit the bullet made the decision and I was so excited because in making that decision this person was showing up for themselves and then we had a conversation about showing up for yourself which was just I wish I had my microphone then but the take home from it that I wanted to share with you is that showing up for yourself is sometimes those tough decisions that will better you and everyone around you in terms of like your support system is giving you advice or like strength and cheering you on but ultimately the decision is yours and by making that decision you're showing up for yourself that thought should help you battle whatever fear you're going through that's stopping you from making that decision or doing that particular thing that is an act of showing up for yourself. I really hope that makes sense. <laughs> if not, I'll just have to bring that friend onto the podcast for us to have a conversation about this. But yeah, that's number one. Number two is honoring yourself. Ah, I'm really loving this one because I think I, I have as I've said before, come home to myself. And I found that one of the greatest ways for me to honor who I am and to honor myself and to celebrate myself is to truly be myself. You know what I mean? Like even in the spaces that require you to reduce who you are or require you to be someone else so that you can either get ahead. You know what I mean? Even when being yourself means that you are not fitting in, you're the awkward person. <sighs> Just choosing to truly be you unapologetically is honoring yourself, which is something you should try and do every day. Those are the two things I really wanted to share with you. <laughs> I really hope they make sense because <laughs> I've been thinking about them this week ever since I had that conversation and I've even like written about them. I was like, oh my God, I have to share this on the podcast episode. On to the song of the week that I absolutely love. And the first time I heard the song, I was just like, skimming through YouTube, you know, like how you're listening to an artist and then it recommends another song, another song, another song that I landed on this particular song. When I watched the video and listened to the song on YouTube, I wasn't so captivated by this particular song. <laughs> and then <laughs> I listened to it a second time in a different context where I was only listening to what well, was more like... <sighs> 
how do I explain this? <laughs> Where it was only the audio A. And it was basically part of like a sex playlist. <laughs> And in this second context, I was like, hey, this song is not half bad. <laughs> so I have put a link to this particular song in the description of this episode so you can watch the video. I hope it captivates you. It really, <laughs> it didn't do it for me. But then when I heard it the second time, I was like, ooh, this is a good song for ambiance. <laughs> So the name of the song is Roll Some More and it's by Lucky Day. Just check it out. You could check it out on YouTube, add it to specific playlists. I highly recommend that. <laughs> I hope it creates the right ambiance for you as well. So we need to go into the 100 African story in this episode. Our storyteller is Faith. Faith is part of the key route family and they are Kenya's first full-time traveling family made up of course of Faith and Kev and their two kids. So what happened is they sold some of their stuff, packed up the rest and they live on the road traveling from county to county in Kenya with their two kids and here's their story. A hundred African stories on Legally Clueless. Stories from Africa. My name is Faith and I come from Kenya. I was born in Migori, that is deep in Kenya Nyanza and that is where I grew up, that's where I went to school. I actually went to Landa Girls High School, that's really in southern Nyanza, part of Kenya. I remember as a child walking to school that is in primary school. So primary school in Kenya is depending on when you start, maybe at the age of from five to around 13 or depends, the ages depend, but that was like my age gap, five to 12. So I remember walking to school and praying. I mean, I didn't know really how to pray, but I think I remember knowing how to say the Lord's Prayer. And really the biggest part of my prayer or meditation I can say was asking and praying that I'd be able to get out of this village life and have experience of Nairobi because at that point growing up Nairobi you know Nairobi is a capital city and I would remember seeing you know slightly older people who had gone to university coming home and they looked fancy they looked different and I was like I just want to be like them and I will go to class I my mom is a teacher one of the things about being raised by a teacher if you are a teacher's child you know that they invest in your academia so I remember going to a very good school that really was a strain for her but for some reason she felt we needed good education the problem with going to a really good school that has a cohort of very uh, well established homes kids from well established homes is you go through a lot of uh, pressure, I think. So I'm the first born in a family of three. I have two brothers. I watched my brothers go through a lot of self-esteem issues because I remember carrying tea in a bottle while eating lunch and other, you know, the, my classmates would have like things like chips and chicken. At that point as a child, it's such a big deal. You're thinking, I'm taking tea and someone else is taking chips and chicken. It's funny that those are things that don't tickle me anymore. But as a child, it means so much. So I remember that was such a big deal. And for me, my redemption was just be good in class, you know, because even if they have all these things, be good in class and then you kind of beat them when that time comes. So at least you have something to also show. If you don't have the physical goodies, you know, you have the brain goodie. And that was kind of even the push that my mom used to tell us, like, just work hard, show people that you have a voice by just how much you shine in academia. So I carried that through life. I remember going to high school and then my focus, I actually don't have memories of growing up as a child playing or doing anything. For me, it was just focus in school. Just that is how you get to redeem yourself. That is how you get to have a place uh, in the world. So I, I went to high school at that point, Orlando Girls High School, and I don't have any memories of being a a child in playing around it was just memories of me focusing in school and then I transitioned and got called to the University of Nairobi but prior to that I had always desired to be a journalist so I remember before getting the the letters it takes at that time it takes it used to take I think two years 
no, a year and then you take like two years, then you transition to uni. I told mom that I wanted to do journalism. So I went to Kenya Institute of Mass Communication at a diploma level, actually. That is before the results came out and you don't know if you're going to be picked for uni or not. So me, I was just like, I want to be a journalist. Let's just try this thing. So yeah, she took a loan and took me and did one year and then got stuck. Like she could not continue past that. Thank goodness, because at the time that she... I uh, was stuck, the letters came and had gotten an entry to the University of Nairobi. So I was called to do anthropology. And at first, it was such a bummer. I was like, first, I'm not sure what anthropology is and whatever it is, I don't want it. I just want to be a journalist. So I remember going to the administration and telling them I want to be a journalist. And they're like, oh, well, we don't offer journalism at a government-sponsored level because my invitation was through a government-sponsored system you have to pay. And I was like, okay, that's impossible. Dream shattered. I can't just do that because clearly if we couldn't afford a diploma level, how can we afford a degree level? But I embraced my journey. I did uni. It was... It was an amazing time, but also deep within, I always felt like I want an opportunity to go back and do journalism. And then as I transitioned, this whole world of social media came to mind. At that point, it wasn't so big. I remember knowing a few vlogs and really not watching because you're in uni, your focus is not investing in internet to watch. But I remember having a glimpse of what it means to be online and have a voice online. And I remember seeing, I can't remember her name but one of the vloggers just having a platform and talking about herself and I was like maybe one day when I'm done with uni I can actually have a YouTube channel and just create my own quote-unquote journalism platform and that transition some things happen and you know those dreams kind of die so uh, I got married and then we got kids but I always had a burning desire so I started a channel actually immediately after we got married that talked about marriage Imagine talking about marriage immediately after you get married. It's crazy. <laughs> you're still figuring out marriage and then you're talking about marriage. But it's just because I was looking for something to resonate with, to just get to this place of telling a story. I've always wanted to tell stories. So I was like, what is it that I feel confident in that I can use to tell my story? So I was like, okay, I'm married young. Maybe I can just share my experience married young. And we did it for some time. And I remember early years of marriage crazy sometimes, especially if you get married young, the finances, uh, because both of us just got married as we transition from uni, the finances. And I was just like, you know what? I don't even feel like talking about marriage. I just want to work on my marriage. Yeah. So that kind of died. I've also been working online virtually. So I was like, ah, I have something that um, I believe a lot of Kenyans or Africans or people around the world could learn from. So I could share my experience of how I get jobs online, maybe with other people. So I, I changed that channel to be a platform where I talk about making money. And I would watch myself, I'm like, this is not what I want. Yes, I know I want to tell a story, but these are not the stories I want to tell. Because I felt like in a big way, they defined me. They, I, I really looked for, for a definition in, in what I did. So yeah, I got married at... 24. So I remember getting married and then I got to a place where I, I didn't like the thought of social media because there was just a way you had to appear on social media. I would look at people's feeds and they looked so seamless and perfect. And I was like, I don't think there's anything perfect about my story to share. I don't have picture perfect locations to share. I don't have like a picture perfect house that I can take photos with my kids looking all bubbly to share. So I was like, no one is going to give me attention. And I will try post something and see the response and then archive it because I'm like, mm, no one talked, no one commented, no one did anything. So I just archive it. So I just focused on working and said, you know what, maybe this whole storytelling thing is just a dream in my brain. But one exciting thing looking back is that when my husband and I, my husband is called Kev. When Kev and I met, we both had a desire to travel. The funny thing about him, he actually had a dream book. And his dream book, he wanted to travel to a lot of country. The guy was planned. Like, I knew what I wanted to do, but I didn't have it written down. He knew what he wanted, and he had it written down. And I was like, hey, dude, you got dreams. So that was a very connecting element and both of us had a passion for family so those are the two things that connected us the love for family and then my husband also actually grew up in a single parented home so none of us had ever seen how one a unifying family would look like we only knew having a mother so i think that gave us the desire to really have a grounded family and really provide a platform for 
our girls to really have a family, you know, just create a different setup for them. So we had family and travel as one of the things that really connected us. And the funny thing about travel, though, is it's very, I don't know if it's considered, I'd say considered because now uh, getting to share my experience about travel, I think it may not be as expensive as it's made to be. But if you look at it, every single curation of travel is this thing that is un- for people who are untouchable, people, not any random person can do it. So I remember like there are times we had never actually gone on any vacation during our marriage. You know, I remember actually our honeymoon, uh, we were being told, uh, you know, the money that you guys have, save it, and then you guys can <laughs> can build, you know, buy land and build a home. Uh, whatever you get, you guys don't even buy a car, just focus on building a home. That was, I don't know if it's a Kenyan thing or it's my village thing, but I feel like there's always this thing for finish school, get a job, buy a piece of land, build a home, and then, in fact, I feel like sometimes you're told to build a home before you marry if you're a man then look for my for us that has always been the vibe and i remember looking back my husband and i sitting down and asking okay someone is telling me to build a home yes i may be getting say maybe 450 dollars a month how is that even possible to build a home because this is still the money you're using to pay your bills and it's still the money that you're supposed to build a home with so it will mean that you starve yourself and then save up to hopefully live long enough to build a home. I know I say it sarcastically because for us, we got to a point where we felt life is such a roller coaster and you can't live your life always wishing for that thing that looks so far away from you, yet you have something that you can start doing today to just enjoy your life as it is. Then I remember when COVID struck, it was such a bad moment for us. We've always had this fear for, no, we can't travel because we don't have the money. And then if we start traveling, how will our family look at us? You know, people will be like, oh, you guys are spending. Because again, that's the mindset. When you're traveling, you're using a lot of money. Not using, actually. You are wasting a lot of money. So we're like, if we start traveling, people are going to be like, so you guys have the money and you can't support your family. So there was just a lot of limitation mindset. That is one. And then another thing, there was always a lot of fear for stepping out because where we used to stay before we transition is close to my husband's family home so there was always a safe landing place you're like if anything ever happens you know we can always just go back to mom and hey we need some help or something like that so COVID hit there was just this vibe of experiencing death at a very close range a lot of people we know lost their loved ones it was painful like in fact there was this thing for every week. You're like, okay, God, what is happening this week? Because there was always news for someone has lost their child. Someone has lost their wife. Someone has lost their loved ones. We just go to a place where we're thinking life is too short. I know life is short. I know people die. But then until it happens so close to you, it hits you that it's actually really short. So we started thinking, we work, both of us work online, right? So why can't we just transition? Even if it doesn't mean traveling, you know, forever, let's just try getting out of Nairobi and see how this thing works. And it's so funny because now during that season, a friend of ours came to visit and they tell us, oh, we were driving through Narok and we saw these nice houses and you're like, so beautiful. And we just thought of you guys, you're like, if we were you guys, we'll actually move out of Nairobi and go stay there. So there was just a season where there was a vibe of a lot of people telling us, you guys have a life that you could actually just live where you want. And they didn't know that how much impact this was making in our lives because we've been thinking we can move. But then again, if you work virtually, if you have ever done freelance work, before you get to that level of stability, there's a lot of uncertainty because freelance is, I'd say, part time. It can be feel full-time, but it is part-time. And that is the thing. I feel like full-time jobs are illusion. It makes you feel comfortable and peaceful and with your circumstance because you know you have a salary at the end of the month. But really, it is an illusion because anything can happen. But now what freelance does, it, it makes you aware of that illusion. So you know that this job, I could wake up in the morning And the client is like, this project is not going as planned, so we are putting a pause. And that is what you are expecting. And at that point, you have two kids. And it's just like, oh my goodness. So we were like, okay, if we go out there to travel, if that happens to us, what do we do? Do we come back home? So we were like, you know what? Maybe let's try. What's the worst that can happen? If anything, it's our story. So I remember us packing our things 
And our initial, actually, our initial idea was to get a smaller house and put our things there and then come out here, try, see how this thing works. And then if it doesn't work, we have a fallback plan. Our second idea was let's sell everything and then we just go. So the fear of the second idea was, oh my God, if this doesn't work, we don't have a fallback plan. But it was also hard because we were had planned already to live in two weeks. And you're thinking, where are we going to get people to start selling this thing to? And the funny thing, we did not want to put it public that we're actually making this decision. So we're like, if we start asking our friends to help us get these things to be sold, they will know. And we don't want people speaking in our voices, in our brain. Because something that happens when people speak in your brain is you start questioning yourself. It's so funny because because just two days after now we had settled on getting a small place to keep them, a friend of ours asked us, would you guys consider selling your stuff? And then we're like, wait, what? Yes, we would. So they told us, okay, we'll come to your house, see what we need, and then take them. So they came, picked what they need. And of course, because it was rushed, uh, we were happy just giving them and then they pay an installment, which is fine. Then the rest that now remained were little. So we just gave those ones out and that was it. That moment made me freeze. I was just like, my goodness, what did I do? Like, I just sold everything and gave out everything. And it's not like I have that money liquid cash, so I can fall on it if things don't work. I don't have it. I have two kids. We have freelance jobs. What did I just do? But then that was also a turning point in our lives because we knew that we don't have a fallback plan. And that has been one of the things that has pushed us beyond, beyond our expectation Anytime you know that this is all you have, you put your best foot forward and you go for it and you, you don't have doubts. It's funny, like there's no day that we wake up and ask ourselves, should we stop after giving up our stuff and getting in the car? I remember debating, actually, we debated about do we come with a car or do we use a train or do we use a flight? Flight was out of our radar at that time because, again, you was trying to save any penny you can. The train we felt was just not safe because that was right in the middle of COVID with the kids and even really the plane because we didn't know the measures that were being taken at that point. The car felt more comfortable because we said if we go out there and we get to a place where we don't have a place, we can just travel in the car with our kids and just move along. So the car felt comfortable and then we felt we really need to pay extra transport because we already have a car and it can be a roof for some time until we figure out ourselves. So we drove down from Nairobi and our first stop was at Kilifi. And I remember getting into the BNB that we had got and the Airbnb and looking at the excitement in our kids' faces. It was such a changing moment. And it's like, we did this. You are in the middle of a place where you know no one. All you know is your husband and your two girls. And these are kids that 100% depend on you. And you have joy in your heart, but you also have, you're wondering, what, what did I just do? So we settled in and I remember our first time going to the beach together. The beach, it's called Bofa Beach, Kilifi. That place was so beautiful. The serenity, the quietness. And I remember sitting down with our family, our girls, and holding each other's hands and praying in that moment. And we knew that our lives are forever changed, that we are never going back. We're never getting out of this pain. Then we transitioned from Kilifi to Malindi in two weeks' time and the excitement in our faces. And that was just the start of a new thing in our journey. We've had so many adventures. We have turned Malindi upside down. We've seen everything that needs to be seen in this place. Our idea was really to come down here and interact with the culture. So we have constantly played around with how do we want to travel? How do we want to really make this thing sustainable? So at first we were like, we want to be able to interact with the culture of the people around here. It's just been a roller coaster. And the truth is just like any marriage, just like any family, you keep tweaking your, your plans. So what we can say right now is that we know that this is something we want to do. And for me, it just revived my desire to tell stories and to tell beautiful stories of our country, beautiful stories of Africa, and to show that our country has so much to offer. Yes, yet, yet yes, there's a lot of pain sometimes. There is sometimes a lot of 
issues, but then there's just beauty in what we have. We chose to share our story, an ordinary Kenyan couple, an ordinary Kenyan family. And we know that there may seem to be not much out there, but we knew for sure that sharing our story, we hope to encourage ordinary Kenyans, ordinary young couples, ordinary young families to get off their comfort zone and just pursue the lives of their dreams. And the life of your dream does not have to be like ours. It doesn't have to be travel, but it can just be something that you've wanted to do for so long. And one of the things that holds you captive is the limitation mindset, the fear. And growing in a place where you are not allowed to do unorthodox things, it's so easy to conform and just be in a box where you have to do things the way everyone else does things. And then it just limits you because you always go back and feel bad and feel like you're not living your life. Some of the biggest moments through this journey has been looking at how much growth our girls have experienced. Our younger girl is 18 months now and she is talking. This girl is on a roller coaster of saying new words every day. She's surprising us. Like her mind just opened up. I, I don't know what to credit it for, but also I just think the exposure that she's had, you should see when, I remember when we went to um, the beach for the first time and one of the beaches had these waves. She literally say, wow, amazing. Okay. At that point she was 17 months and you're like, wait, what did you just say? Wow. Amazing. And that is amazing because nowadays she tells us the Kenyan coast is very hot. So she has moments where she says, mom, beach, or she says, mom, pool, or she says, mom, water. And I'm like, wait, what? Can you, like, you're literally talking? Those are moments that has made us so happy, has made us so joyful that we made these decisions. And we've also had very sad moments. And for me, one of it that happened was two weeks ago when I realized that none of my friends actually were supporting what you do. You know, I think you have a general expectation from people you call your friends to support you. I, that's just a general expectation. And I remember getting a message from one of my friends that really broke me. And in that message, I felt harshly judged. I felt harshly condemned for making a decision that weirdly did. I don't know how it really, I still can't comprehend why, but I I just felt sad in that moment and it put me down for a very long time. And then I realized, you know what? I'm looking at this as, for example, if I started a business today, right, selling cars and my friends already have cars, I wouldn't, I shouldn't expect them to buy my car, cars from my company just because I'm selling a car and they are my friend. So for me, I started looking at this as a business because now this is the thing. When you make such decisions and you already have kids, it's not a joke. Their life is, is on, I can't say their life is on the line because every single decision we make affect their story for their background. Because just looking at how I started, there's a lot of my story that is connected to my background. There's a lot of my story that is connected to how I grew up. So there's a lot to their story that will be connected to how we raise them right now. So for us, it's very important that we try as much as possible to make the right decisions. So we invest our time in seeking God and praying and listening to each other. We always want to ensure we are on the same page about a lot of decisions just because our kids are in the and you know, their lives, I can't say their lives are on the line because the foundation we give them right now really shapes, not really how they turn out because I've seen people who've grown up in, you know, very shaky backgrounds but turned out well, but in a big way, it really shapes who they are. And yes, there are a lot of fears when, when you have, when you're traveling with kids, one of it is, and, and that is not actually a fear, that is actually a reality, uh, change in weather. I remember when we first came in, the younger girl was really affected by uh, the high temperatures in the Kenyan coast because uh, where, where we used to stay in Nairobi was along Limuru Road. So that's very, very cold. And then we just literally uprooted them from a very cold environment, a very hot environment. So she got affected with the heat. And when any time you make these decisions and you have kids and you see them affected, even just a normal thing, you feel like, oh my God, is, is my decision going to affect my kids? So yes, 
that was such a big moment for me fearing and then anytime like i feel like maybe we go to a place and it's slightly uh crowded i'm like no let's go back home i don't want to expose my kids to covid you know there's just those fears so what we've done traveling with kids is we try and just make it our family centered and i know there are a lot of people that have reached out to us uh desiring to join us in our adventures and i'm sorry that we haven't been that open for now because we just you know like an 18 month old cannot wear a mask so we try as much as possible to just not expose her to an environment where she has to be in a space where she has to wear a mask so that has limited interacting very close knit and but for us we're glad that we started either way a moment that actually really reaffirmed our decision was how my mom and Kev's mom reacted so before we left we called Kev's mom. So we we stay closer to Kev's mom. My mom is way way back in Migori so the, she's really far away. I feel like my mom already let go because of her, the distance. So she's always really fine and she's always been like, "Ah, whatever it is uh, that you want to do, you know, let God will God's will prevail." I, I grew up in a very strong Christian background, so there's a lot of allowing God's will to prevail. So for me I wasn't worried about my mom, but because we have a very close interaction with Kev's mom we were like oh my goodness what is going to be a reaction so I remember when we first told her she was like oh okay uh that's nice and we're like no wait what that's nice like you have nothing to say I'm like yeah who am I to really like decide how you guys live your life and then we were like no this is sarcastic she 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 was maybe we thought like she's sad and she just doesn't want to talk about it so we gave her like three days and then told her we want to meet physically and talk about it and she was like I am fine. Actually, I remember her saying, now I just need to get a phone that has a good WhatsApp so that us guys can do video calls. And I was like, what? That is that is so reaffirming. So yeah, that was awesome. My mom, actually, I remember my mom saying, ah, I've been actually really wondering why you guys stay in the middle of a city and it's not like you have virtual physical jobs. So yeah, that's a good idea and i remember my brothers were like yeah you're going to a fun place we can't wait to come and visit so our family was really like ah it's not a big deal i mean as long as you know we still need together and then we also try and do a lot of as much free activities as possible and then maybe just use money in major activities that there's no work around it yeah so we've done when you when in malindi malindi has a lot of very small places so that we've gone to and it's really just malindi town but it has a lot of small places like this cheshale <laughs> yeah that's it's a very nice place where there's uh kite surfing and then so I, I'd say that because we started just in, during COVID and then how we've been moving was, has not been aggressive. So we've been just moving one town to another. So what we've done so far is whenever we go to a place, we just exhaust it. And our highlight for Malindi has just been being at the beach together, going to Marafa. Yes, Marafa Hell's Kitchen. That's a place in Malindi. It's a depression, actually. So it's a depression where you go through it. It becomes like some form of hiking. And that was such a thrill experience. Hiking with, at that time, she was 17 months, a 17 months old that is still breastfeeding. And she just wanted to breastfeed every single minute because the reason why it's called Hell's Kitchen is that that place is so hot. So I think because of the heat, she would want to breastfeed every time. And I would sit down sometimes. I'm like, oh my goodness, what am I even doing? Like, what am I doing? Climbing a form of quote unquote mountain depression. It, it actually looked like a canyon, right? So what am I doing here with the baby? But then after we finish that transition and get to the top and then she says, yay. And I'm like, oh, okay. So you're enjoying while I'm here beating myself. And the younger one was like, ah, we, I can't believe we did this. And then we've also visited uh, some locals. So I remember when we went to a village, the name is very, uh, one of the Kenyan language is very Mijikenda, so I can't exactly remember the name, but that really changed our lives. For me, it was not anything new because I grew up seeing that form of maybe poverty. For my husband, it was such a nerve-wracking place because it was like, wow, people go through this. A very big highlight in our travel has been realizing that we don't need things 
some of these things. We just need to have, we, ju- we don't need to have everything we want or any, everything that has been offered to us. We just need to have what we need. So at this point, actually, each of us has a backpack of clothes. Uh, when we first came, I remember when we were packing, my husband was like, you're packing a lot. I'm like, okay, yes, I'm a girl. I want to pack my dresses. Please, I'm going to the Kenyan coast. For those who have visited the Kenyan coast, you know, this is a place where you bring out all your beautiful short sleeve dresses and, you know, just want to (laughs) sleep. But then uh, I realized that that's not the whole point. We were not coming for a vacation. This is now our life. This is now a lifestyle that we live. And when you are living your life, you don't wear your beautiful dresses every day. There are days that you break down. There are days that you're happy, there are days that you're not, there are days that you don't even want to get out of your bed, which that has not happened because of just how adventurous we are. And the funny thing is anytime any of us feel down, we're like, let's go do this. So that has really motivated us. But for us, getting to a place where each of us has now just a backpack, actually we gave out some other clothes. After after giving out some clothes, we gave out again another batch of clothes while we are here. So now we have a backpack of clothes each and we are just so ready to to go to another place. And I know I can't really say that with certainty that this is exactly where we are going. I can't really say that we know how tomorrow looks because I don't think any of us really knows how tomorrow looks. We have plans, we have desires, but we truly don't know how tomorrow looks. But our desire is just to now get on board into traveling full time, you know, because we've been traveling full time, but we've been staying in one place at a time. So for now, we want to go from one town to another, one episode to another. And it's it's so exciting. One of the questions we get a lot is then how do the kids get education? And this is a funny question because I feel there's a lot of confusion between academia and education. The academia part is, yes, part of the education. But then again, this is another thing that I feel there's a lot of mindset shift that needs to be done because life is just not about the books. We are huge propagators of books and academia. I mean, if we didn't go to uni, probably we wouldn't have had the exposure that we have today. So yes, we are huge propagators of academia, but we are huge believers in education. And when I talk about education, it's the experiences we go through. Those are education. The heart, the pain, the the moments that, the things, the people we meet that hurt us or change our lives, those are education. So yes, we homeschool our kids. They have a bag where we do the academics part. And yes, I know it's easy to say, do you have a degree in teaching? No, 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 no. We don't have a degree in teaching. But I will give you an example. Look at a parent who is an ambassador, right? They move from one country to another. Ask yourself, how do their kids school? Sometimes they have private tutors. Sometimes they jump from one school to another. Sometimes they are taught at home. What matters is that they have experience that none of us can really have. So for us, yes, for now, we homeschool our kids. When they get to a place where we can't take care of it anymore, we can really maybe look for private tutors or find how to go with it. But at this point, a six-year-old doesn't need to really stay in school for eight hours, at least in our opinion, in order for them to have a future. They're still very young for us to be able to use the knowledge we have to give them a foundation in academia but our focus is to enrich them with experiences that will absolutely change their minds and our worldview has changed how we look at life has really really changed like for us life is so short I know everyone knows that life is short, but until you get off your comfort zone, you're not able to acknowledge that life is short. When you still expect that salary at the end of the month, when you still know that you're going to show up and you have a seat to stay on, you don't really acknowledge that life is short. But when you know for sure that you don't have a fallback plan, it's you and God. I keep referring to God again because I'm a believer. It's you and God. It changes your mind. We've learned to live our lives one day at a time. We've learned to make compromises. One of my biggest compromise was I loved my space in the kitchen. I love big kitchens with good countertop where I can just go full board and start cooking and sitting down. But then that's the thing. That is a life that we can't afford when traveling full time because again, the houses you get, you have to make a compromise. The places you stay in, you have to make a compromise. I was those people who could not eat out. I just loved eating my food at home. We've had circumstances where 
my husband and I have to eat out because we are on the road and I, I was I, I, I was not able to make something for us to carry or you can just carry food. So there's just been a lot of compromises that we've made. And for us, we have changed how we look up life. And the biggest thing for us right now is that we have found genuine happiness. And when I say happiness, it doesn't mean that our life is a, such a perfect, picture perfect. No, we have days that we go through emotions. We have days that we actually worry, like, what's what, what, how does... Uh, the future look and let me give you an example of a worry so picture yourself in a place where you know no one you're traveling with two kids you guys are married uh in the middle of a pandemic okay and then you're called and told that your friend has lost their mom immediately what hits you it's oh my goodness what if i lose my spouse right now like how does that work you know i'm in the middle of a place we have sold our stuff you know what's the fallback plan so we have had moments where we're scared we're like Okay, maybe me. I don't know if my husband goes through those roller coasters. He he always seems very stable when it comes to his emotions. Uh, but I've had moments where I'm scared. I'm sure he has too, but uh, it just changed me. Changes how I look at things. So for us, we always say that either way, in one way or another, we pray that if God takes us home, we go together. But in one way or another, if one of us goes, we will have built memories, we will have invested in each other's lives when we still have the opportunity to, so much so that it will not, not having that person in your life will not be that cry of pain that you did not spend enough time with them, but it will be a cry of, oh my goodness, I miss the moments we had together. So we choose to invest in each other's lives. We choose to invest time in each other's desires in each other's dreams supporting each other we don't have a, a, a structure of oh you do this we do this we are in this together every one of us just give their hundred percent and we just flow so uh, our lives have been changed i don't think i am capable of going back renting a house and staying in one place we are not we are not capable of doing that right now because we see the life, we see, we see the world so different. In fact, our kids have gotten to a place where when we we wake up in the morning, they're like, What are we doing today? They are so excited about every new adventure that comes their way. And it's been amazing. There are days I sit down and tears just flow. Yeah, I cry a lot in the bathroom because then growing up <laughs> tears was not something that you're supposed to show people so I cry when I shower that way no one notices I'm crying the water cleans up my tears and then <laughs> I'm good to go so yes there are moments I go to shower and I cry and then when I come out I'm feeling so fresh and my eyes so red then it looks like it's the shower that made me cry but yes that made my eyes red so there are moments I cry because of joy the joy that I've been able to invest in my desires, I've been able to invest in my husband's life, the joy that I've been able to invest in my children's life. And for me, I know that this is not something that everyone is able to do. So it is a huge privilege to be able to see each other together every day. We spend 24 hours a day, seven days a week, like 90% of the time. You know, either maybe... Uh, Kev has to go do something with the car, which we're always together still, uh, unless maybe it's really hot and you're like, just go, or a baby's sleeping and we don't want to distract them, so we're like, just go. But the fact that God has given us the opportunity to be able to spend this much time together, for me, I don't take it for granted. It's just been, I think, 90 days as of today or less, and our hearts are full. I cannot even start explaining what the future holds. If three months can change our lives, I don't know what the future holds. And for us, we're just on an adventure of, we say that we sold our things to travel the world, to world school, our, our kids and ourselves, because I love this quote that says that travel in the younger self is education and travel in the older self is experience, I think. I can't remember exactly how it says. For, for us, we are both schooling. My husband and I are changing the uh, worldviews that has been rooted in our lives for 20-something years of our lives. And uh, Kev is 30 now. Uh, yeah, but yeah, for all that years of our lives. And our kids are getting a raw page 
to write their own story and look at the world in a way that is so different from us. So the, the struggle with that is we have a worldview that we are trying to change. So once in a while, we still go back into that world and then realize, oh my goodness, no, we've given these kids something that is so different. So we have to find a way of getting back. I don't know if that makes sense. Like you have lived your life in a certain way, fear, uh, you know, conforming, following rules. But then all of a sudden now you're living a life that people don't understand. And then the struggle of, I can't say it's a struggle, the fascination of this journey has been, there hasn't been any other Kenyan family traveling full time with their kids that have gone ahead that we can learn from. In fact, we have even tried, I'm sure maybe there's someone doing it around Africa, but maybe they're not sharing their story online. So yes, we haven't met. So I can just say for now, it's only us. So the struggle with that, this is not a new concept actually in the first world countries. Like we have a lot, we see a lot of families in the US and the UK traveling full time with their kids. But sometimes it's just when you have someone walking in a shoe that you kind of relate with, it's easier to learn from them. So for us, the funny thing has been, we don't have someone who's gone ahead who do this thing. It looks like a challenge, but we've actually come to realize it's not a challenge at all. It's given us the opportunity to write our own story without emulating anyone's story. It's given us the opportunity to pro- hopefully pioneer something so authentically without having the pressures of conform- conforming to a way it's done. So for us, we don't have the pressure of, oh, this family did this way, so we have to do it this way. And even if they did it that way, we're like, ah, you know what, they're in a different continent. Probably their struggles are different from us. So it's just been beautiful being able to write our own story in our own way without the pressure that can come with putting yourself out there as a family uh, on social media. And uh, of course, coming also from a place where people believe, oh, don't put your kids on social. And yeah, those have been challenges here and there but we're like but they are kids and we are going to a generation where probably ah, that's gonna be like the life they live so yeah we still we still have days where we don't have a perfect script of how we should do this but we just do it one day at a time catch more african stories in the next episode of legally clueless oh my word i absolutely want to be faith and care when i grow up <laughs> Can you imagine how awesome that would be? And I, I'm so happy for their kids because, you know, when she spoke about the difference between academia and education, I feel like past generations always focused on the academia bit and we didn't really learn the workings of the world. You know what I mean? And our education system did not. Well, ours in Kenya at the time, which was 844, I know it's changed now. It didn't do much to educate us about the world. You know what I mean? (laughs) So I'm like, oh, this is so interesting. I also loved when she talked about not having a fallback plan. Because another thing that's been glorified for us, maybe not in a full-time traveling family context. But, you know, you have to have a side hustle and you're juggling all of these things. I feel like sometimes the plan B will never prosper because it's just that it's a plan b so until you make it plan a you won't really give it as much resources in terms of time or whatever is needed to make it successful as long as you look at it as a side hustle it will always just remain that tiny you know what i mean obviously there's benefits to having like a plan b c (laughs) but i've also seen the benefits of having one plan because it really forces you to make it work and even if at points you fail you're more determined to like figure out a solution if you're facing some sort of challenge so when she was talking about that i was like oh my god i get this and of course another thing which i've said on this podcast before when she talks about like the fear of losing her spouse and ugh man y'all know i feel that 110 percent so petrified of grief ugh Like my own death doesn't scare me. I've made a lot of peace with the fact that it's inevitable. I will die. And so I'm just trying to make sure I live as much as possible on the days that I have the capacity to do that. But losing the people that I love, oh my God, that really terrifies me. That, uh, I don't even want to, no, no, it's a nice sunny day. I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to think about that right now, but yeah. So what I'm going to do is in the description of this episode, I've put a link to the Kiru's Instagram page so you can follow their journey as they're 
traveling full time. They share regular updates of the different places they are at. They share very fun videos of them talking about life videos of their kids who are just so adorable so make sure you join their online community i think what they're doing is super interesting another thing that you can do if you want to share your story on this podcast is record a one minute story demo you can just use your whatsapp audio note feature for that tell me a bit about the story you want to share and then send that to the legally clueless hotline which i am now fumbling to get on my phone because i have not memorized it yet oh my god podcast no Hey, how am I spelling this? Okay, the hotline number is plus two five four seven six eight six two eight seven nine zero. That's also the number that you can share if you've identified with something on this podcast because this is a space not only for me but for you as well. Something has stood out for you in an episode and you want to share about it, you can record an audio note and send that to the hotline as well. Hey Adele, just to say thank you so much for sharing your voice on the podcast. I listened to it randomly. I was listening to episode 46 just the other day when I was traveling. It was actually the best idea to have downloaded it. And it was, you know, about abstaining and finding your husband in university. And it's really interesting. Myself, I'm 30 years old and I've been battling with this urge to be abstinent for quite a long time. Actually, I have been in four relationships, actually all of the relationships that I've been wanting to be celibate, but the flesh is weak. And I really commend that lady for really choosing to start from an early stage. Thank you so much for sending in this message. I do remember that story. It was such a memorable story. It was recorded in one of the universities when Legally Clueless did a university tour end of 2019, I believe. Ah, yeah, that I lo- I still even remember the story. To- well, I remember all storytellers, but I remember her energy was so confident and calm and like grounded and settled. And I kept thinking of how I was in university compared to the energy she had. I was like, what? <laughs> Sis, <laughs> you are light years ahead of everybody. About the whole being celibate thing, I can't really identify with that because currently I'm really rediscovering myself as a sexual being. And so I, I, I really don't know much <laughs> about that space. I do respect it though, um, but I, I don't know much about it. But I did... I have a friend who was trying to hit one year of being celibate. And I had another friend who did the same because they got a sense of clarity when they put the brakes on sex and anything sexual. And I'm all I'm all for anything that makes you connect with yourself better. If it gives you clarity, go for it. I really do appreciate you listening to the podcast and sending in your audio notes as well. Do remember that this podcast plays on Trace radio in kenya every monday wednesday and friday at 12 noon and at 7 p.m so if you're in kenya you can catch it in nairobi on 95.3 in nakuru 91.8 in kisumu 99.1 in eldoret 90.9 and in mombasa on i don't know why i sang that 92.0 92.0 okay we've come to the end of this episode thank you so much for listening to this podcast and if you're new remember there is a new episode every single monday that's it for this episode of legally clueless you can share this podcast with your friends you can keep it for yourself i'm not judging just make sure you're here next week for the next episode <laughs>